Thank you for texting, though. <clears throat> Thank you for sending the message. All right, let's go ahead and pray, and then we will dive right in and uh, talk a little bit about Joseph and the things that he was going through and how they relate to us and, and how we can see uh, those things in our own lives. So let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity to come together. We thank you for how you're always there for us. Yes, amen. So that you were always there for us, Lord. You call us into situations and circumstances and that we may be faithful and, and, and apply ourselves to those circumstances when they come up. You always take us out of our comfort zone, Lord. You always seem to disrupt our, our routine, and it's for a good purpose. May we always be faithful and follow you. So, Father, we ask a blessing today on this teaching that it would be your message that comes forth that you would be here with us in a big way. We know that you're always with us, but Lord, that we would feel something special this morning and we would come to understand a little bit better of the way you deal with us, the way you love us, and the way we should deal with you and to love others. So as we accept this teaching today, we pray in Jesus Christ's name and all God's people said, amen. So circumstances, right? We, <clears throat> boy, we get put in some circumstances sometimes, don't we? And uh, how we react to those circumstances uh, really dictate, it, it's like, let's put it like this. Um, you wake up in the morning, you wake up in a bad mood, that kind of dictates how your day is going to go, right? Or if you wake up and you're in a good mood, then you have the opposite effect. Well, it's the same way in, in, a, in the same aspect in a bigger sense for life in general, right? What is your outlook? You know, where's your focus? You know, what, how is it that you uh, view life? How is it that you view circumstances, whether it be good circumstances, difficult circumstances? You know, we all should, we all should view them through, through the lens of the Lord. And, and, and that's what makes the difference. And if there's one thing that we can get uh, from the story of Joseph is that the circumstances that he was put through were horrendous, right? And it wasn't just one. It seemed like one thing after another, after another, after another. But he always looked at it through the lens of, you know, the Lord is good. The Lord is with me. Uh, I'm here to do, you know, his will, not mine. And if that means a little difficulty, and if that means, you know, that I need to go through these things for him to prepare me, to equip me for the work in which he has called me to do, then I'm willing to do it. And, and that's, what you have to, that's what you have to understand. That's what you have to understand. All right, let's go ahead and dive into the first two verses. First two verses. Now, we are picking up in the story in, in chapter 29 of Genesis, we are picking up after Joseph have already been betrayed by his brothers, right? His family, the people that were supposed to love him, the people that were supposed to be there for him. He's been sold off, right? Then the lie has been told uh, to his father that he was killed by a wild animal, right? So we're, we're past that. Now, think about where Joseph is in this, in this time. You know, wow, does anybody love me? Does anybody care, right? The people that were supposed to love me, uh, they just want to get rid of me, right? It was all about jealousy, too. We know that uh, from the understanding we get from Scripture is that, you know, uh, he was well-loved by his father, and his brothers resented it. They resented it. All right. Let's dive in. Verse 1, verse 2. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, a captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Now, remember, who, who, who had him? The Ishmaelites. Ishmael, right? The, the son of Hagar and Abraham. His descendants are coming into the story here, right? Interesting, very interesting. Verse 2, 
the Lord was with Joseph and he was a successful man and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. So, not the best circumstance for Joseph, right? No, he's, in, he's, in, he, he's a slave, right? Could he have had a bad attitude? Who could blame him? Could he have been devastated? Who could blame him, right? There was the difference, though. What does it say? The Lord was with him. He prospered in what he did. In other words, Joseph didn't become overcome by his circumstances and the situation that he was put in because he said, no matter what, you are my God, you are my Lord, right? Let's all go over to, to Acts 7 and verse 9, and it says, And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. So we see that pretty well, you know, stated in scripture that that's the event that's what was happening but god was with him see that's that's what we need to understand it's like it doesn't matter what's what you're going through and what's happening to you right god is with you and and even in the most dire of circumstances even the most dire of circumstances you know the the god the lord is working within that circumstance always right verse 10 and delivered him out of all his troubles. He gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all of his house. So we see further down the line from this point right here that Joseph's circumstances were really going to dramatically change. But he had a lot of difficulty, tough difficulty to go through before he reached that. And his own Focus and attitude could have derailed that whole situation, right? If he had a bad attitude, he wasn't listening, he wasn't growing in the Lord, he wasn't, he wasn't understanding that God was preparing him for something bigger down the road, he would have just wallowed with his own self-pity. God hates me, why is he doing this to me? Nothing ever works out, life is unfair. It goes on and on and on and on, right? Luke 1, verse 28 and having come in, the angel said to her, this is Mary, right? Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. So you have to ask yourself one thing. Was this an easy decision? Was this an easy road for Mary to walk? God had said, this is what I have for you to do, right? Gave her the option, right? Mary Mary dealt with a lot of things because of this decision, right? Many times when God calls us to do something, there's a period of time where he's preparing us or enabling us or equipping us to be able to do that, okay? And that can be a very difficult time. No different here. Joseph, very difficult time, but necessary. Mary, right, went through a lot, but it made her the person that God intended her to be. Psalm 512 says, For you bless the righteous, O Lord, and you cover them with favor as with a shield. Does that mean that God delivers them out of that trouble and that difficulty? No, because it is a necessary element in order for the blessing to come, in order for them to grow and be equipped for what he's calling them to do. And many times, we don't want to do the hard work. You know, just Lord, just bless me. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to go through. <laughs> you know, I don't want to go through all that. That this this does not mean that God's going to take you out of the trouble. If anything, it means that God's going to give you exactly what you need to bring, make you and be the person that He wants and intends you to be to fulfill the, His will and purpose for you in in your life. People think that's astounding. In Luke 2, verse 52, and it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. When we follow what God has for us to do, right? What happens to us? We grow. We grow. And that's what we need to do. 
In Psalm 30, verse 5, it says, For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Listen, we will go through difficulty. And Christ plainly said that to us. He goes, you're going you're, you're to have trouble in this life. There's just no doubt about it. And, and I think we, we have two choices. Either we can be overcome by that trouble, or we can understand that God said, this is the way it's going to be. But I have overcome these things. And so through him, we have the ability to overcome these things. In other words, not be destroyed by those things, right? We were still deal with things. I was talking to somebody the other day, and they said, you know, you know, the loss of this loved one, I don't think I'm ever going to forget it. No, you don't. You're forever changed. You're forever changed by circumstance that you go through. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Don't ever think that, you know, this needs to go away and I can't deal. No, you're supposed to be changed. It's when you focus on the wrong thing. People sometimes get knotted up in, in grief. Is, is it okay to grieve? Absolutely. You should grieve. Should you be overcome by grief? No. No. They are with the Lord. The one place we're all trying to get. Your grief is because of you won't have them in your life. That's, that's your grief. All perspective, right? What focus? What are you? How do you look at it? All right, let's go back into our text, verse three. And his master, Potiphar, saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. What's he thinking? Wow, things seems to seem things seem to work out pretty good when this guy is in charge, you know. God is with him. Maybe I can benefit from this. So when we choose to do the right thing, when we have that moral compass, if you will, moral foundation that we choose to follow God, interesting things happen. Even non-believers, and by all accounts, Potiphar is, is not of the faith. He's, he doesn't even know the same God that Joseph knows. One thing he does know, Wow, this guy has something. This Joseph guy, he has something. Can it benefit me? Right? Because that's the way the world thinks. Can it benefit me? So everything made to prosper in his hand. Verse 4, so Joseph found favor in his sight, served him. Then he made him overseer of his house and all that he had put under his authority. Verse 5. So it was from that time that he made him overseer of his house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake and the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Okay. Interesting. So the blessing of God on a person is for the benefit of not just the person but those around him and that see that's how God works and he will bring he will bring people to himself because they see the blessing that he has put on others and they have actually tasted it if you will and this is where we get in Hebrews where it talks about how you know they have tasted they have tasted or they experienced some small form of the Holy Spirit or some small form of the blessing uh, that, God, that God gives. They don't have it, but they've seen it. They, they've experienced it to a certain extent. They have not accepted it. And that's right where Potiphar is, right? It's right that, where he is. A lot of times I like to make this distinction. It's like, you know, those folks that only go uh, to church on Christmas and Easter, right? They, 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 they sample it. They experience it slightly, but they have not accepted it. So it's interesting that we can see the blessing, but still not accept it. Verse 6, thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate, 
Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. That's important, okay? Um, Joseph had a, a, a great persona about him, right? Uh, he had a good way about him. He was, he was handsome. He looked good. Um, you could say that Joseph had, in our terms, charisma, right? People saw him. They liked him. He was capable. He was, he was able. We can see that, right? God gave him certain things. Pretty cool, right? He's in a bad circumstance, but he's making the best of a bad circumstance. Interestingly enough, we think that, okay, God was with me in this circumstance. Now it's a lot better. I'm home free, right? Is that the way it is? No, never, never, never. We think it is sometimes. It's never like that. Things, if, if there's one thing you can count on, things will change. That's one thing you can count on. Things will change. All right. Let's go over to Psalm 1, Psalm 1 and verse 2, and it says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so. All right. Joseph, in a terrible circumstance, was getting his strength and blessings from the Lord, and it was affecting all those around him. Even unbelievers could see it and wanted to, in some extent, take part in that or reap the benefit of that. Okay? That's where we're at. Joseph is like, Phew. things are a lot better now. Okay? Being sold into slavery by his family, comes into Potiphar. He was probably, at one point, he was probably just a simple, you know, uh, laborer. You know, you're out there, whatever planting crops or whatever, and now he's running the whole thing, okay? God has changed the circumstance because he had an, uh, an attitude. He used the blessings that God gave him. He accepted the gifts that God had given him, all right? Here's Joseph. Things are a lot better. But see, what Joseph and what we don't realize sometimes is God's not done with him. This was just a season it's just a season of his life, and he needed to, things needed to change if he was going to get him to the pinnacle of where God wanted him to be. Let's read on, verse 7, verse 7. And it came to pass after these things that the master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said to him, lie with me. Okay, with the gifts that God gives us, comes temptation, comes, you know, how do I use this in an effective manner while still walking closely with God? There's Joseph, things are good, it's the worst thing that could have happened to him, so he thought, right? Lie with me, she says, verse 8, and he refused. And he said to his master's wife, and this is an important fact. A lot of people don't see this in here. So I want you to look at what we're going to be talking about right here. Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house. And he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor... Has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife? How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? You see, you have to realize what Joseph is saying here. Number one, it is God who put him in that position, right? He said, how is it that God gives me everything? And yet I could willingly do this wickedness or this sin 
in the eyes of God because it will make my life easier. Could he have done this? He says it. No one knows what I do. He goes, everything's been committed to me except you in this house. That's the one thing that I'm not supposed to do. Take you back to the garden. What did God say? You can eat everything except this. Except this. You see, it's not about the thing. It's about where's the heart. Right? Joseph could have easily violated his oath. He could have easily sinned against God and, and, and his master. Right? He could have easily inserted himself in that covenant of marriage. But he said, it's not right. I can't do that. And it's not, it's not about her. It's, even, it's not about Potiphar. And even to some extent, it's not about Joseph. It's about God. And he says, he has given me so much. How could I do these things? In the same way, we should look at our lives in the same aspect and say, God has dealt with me so graciously. How could I do these things? How could I do these things? Hmm. Interesting. Because look what he says, right in the verse, end of verse 9. How could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Right? All sin, no matter what it is, is against God. And it's going to involve other people or other circumstances or whatever, but ultimately it's always against God. Right? And sin means... Walking against God, right? That's what sin is. Anything that is not of God. Verse 10, verse 10. So it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her and lie with her or to be with her. Was this a one-off thing? Hey, you know, she gave it her shot. It didn't work. He's good for me, he's good for my husband, he's doing a good job. I'm just going to let this go. Is that how people are? No. She was relentless. Day after day after day, him trying to do the right thing, being subjected to temptation day after day after day. It reflects me back to what uh, was said about Lot where Lot is in this sinful, sinful place, right? And it says that he was, his spirit was subjected to this sin. It was being contaminated by what was going around him. If, if you are continually put in dire circumstance like this by ungodly people, it will take a toll on you. It will take a toll on you. All right. Verse 11. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house were inside. Trouble, right? There's no one there to support what's going on, right? Verse 12, and she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. You know, this, this was the point where she said, I don't care. I don't care what happens. You know, this is what I want. You know, you're going to give it to me. And she forced his hand. Joseph did what he should have done, right? Ran out of the house. Remove myself from this situation. It's getting, it's getting crazy. It's getting ugly. Even if we do the right thing, we make the right choice, difficult choice, the hard choice, which is usually the right choice. But doesn't mean it doesn't come back to you sometimes, right? Verse 13. And so it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside, that she called to the men of her house and spoke to them, saying, See, he has brought into us a Hebrew to mock us, he came to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And it happened when he heard that I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and he fled and went outside. What was happening here? She's lying, right? Because he spurned her and hurt her feelings, okay? I'm going to punish him. 
Doesn't matter if it's true or not. I, I know people that do this. They will twist and turn things to fit their narrative because they have to. They have to. Now, what do we do with this situation? That's the next thing, right? They're lying, right? Oh, sure they are. Sure they are, right? Listen, it doesn't matter if you do the right thing and you're, and you're, you know, you're, you're trying to walk as close to God as you can. There's going to be people, number one, they're not going to believe you no matter what happens. They're going to walk against you. We know that. We know that. Let's go over to Proverbs 1, and we're going to get some insight. In verse 10, it says, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait to shed blood. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. Listen. If you've been with the Lord for a period of time, you know a couple of things. What's acceptable and what's not. Joseph was totally in the right here. Could he have bent? Could he have given in? To this circumstance and made his life a lot easier? Yes. But he was more concerned with where he was with the Lord than he was where he was in the world. Verse 16. Back into our text now, verse 16. So she kept his garment. So she kept his garment with her until his master came home. And she spoke to him with words like this, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came to me to mock me. So it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and he fled outside. So it was when his master heard these words, which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner, and his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. Boy, first I get sold into slavery. I don't, I don't let it destroy me. I trust in the Lord. I get... I get put on the, in this place. I rise to prominence within the house. And there it is again. There it is again. I'm doing the right thing. I'm trying to stay straight. And yet, I'm being attacked again. What Joseph really didn't, in a bigger view or understanding is he was actually put into Potiphar's house to go to prison where he could then meet the men that were going to introduce him to Pharaoh years later. I mean, he was going to be in this situation for years. And sometimes it can be difficult for us to accept, isn't it? Look at Isaiah 54, verse 17. Where it says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of my servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. And realizing and understanding this is that no matter what's happening to me, I know it came through God's hands. Are you okay with that? And Joseph's circumstance is, is, is really is really difficult to say, okay, Lord, right? Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, verse 11, it says, Blessed are you when you revile and per when they revile and persecute you, and they say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Right? And that's exactly what happened to Joseph here. Because he was following the Lord. Right? I will not sleep with a married woman. It is not right. I will not do this. I will not sin. What happens? Persecuted. 
been happening since the beginning when Cain persecuted Abel right from the beginning. It's still happening today. And Jesus talks about this in the Sermon on the Mount. They would say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Verse 12, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Christ goes on to say, and they persecuted me and they will persecute you. What that means is, if you don't go along with what they want you to do, they're going to attack you. They're going to talk evil about you. They're going to make things up whether they're true or not. They're going to, they're going to come against you. That's what he means. Let them. Let them. We've got to stop caring about what other people say and do and think. I care what the Lord thinks. That's what I care about. All right, let's go back into our story here. We're in verse uh, 21. Verse 21. Verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Right? Joseph was not... Was was he kind of upset? I would imagine. Was he having a touch of uh, depression? You would think so, right? Here it goes again. Just when things start changing. Just when things are getting good. Right? Same thing we say all the time. Same thing. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hands all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. Again, because of who he is. Because of you know his attitude. God has blessed him. He rises again to the top. Listen, it doesn't matter what your circumstance is. You make the best of your circumstance. You keep your faith. You keep your continence with God. You Or you trust and have faith in Him. Right? And what happens? Always. What, what is that saying? Cream always rises to the top. Always. Verse 23. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Love that. Doesn't matter what we do. We walk with the Lord, guess what happens? He blesses that. Right. Again, let's go back to Psalm 1. Right. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor stir, or sits in the seat of the scornful. It's not an attitude we, need, we, we have. That's not something that we embrace. Okay, Romans 5, verse 3. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, Hope, and hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Listen, who's your God? Is he in control of everything? Is he omnipotent? Omnipotent, right? He knows everything. He's in charge of everything. He can do anything. Everything comes through his hand before it gets to you. Then have some faith and trust. Have some faith and trust. That's what he says. 2 Peter 1, verse 5. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, that's the big one, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound in you, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph is learning that no matter how difficult the circumstance, to trust in the Lord and he will prosper him. He will bless him. So when we add to our faith these things that Peter talks about in 2 Peter 1, and knowing that we will go through difficulties, as Paul talks about in Romans 5. Glory in tribulations. You have to understand, God's working, right? When you're going through that 
God's working. Uh, it's kind of difficult for us to have that attitude, but we should. And as we grow and our foundational support grows, right? To your faith, add virtue, to virtue, knowledge, knowledge, self-control. See, we're, we're progressing in our Christian walk. That's what it's all about. It's all about what? Perseverance, sticking to it, no matter what. And that's one thing that Joseph teaches us in great detail. Okay, I'm going to pick myself up. I'm going to dust myself off. All right, Lord, here we go. I'm trusting. Let's go. That's a, that's a great, great understanding. All right. Well, that was, that was good. So let's go ahead and pray. I will let you guys go. Thank you for tuning in on a crazy uh, Thursday morning. <laughs> so, <laughs> hopefully we'll get back on track. We will be in person live meeting on Sunday. Um, I hope to see you guys all here. Uh, if you're tuning in on YouTube again, uh, thank you for, for, for watching. And uh, if you want to get the uh, verses that I'm, I'm reading, the cross-reference verses, uh, you can go ahead and uh, message me or text me. Um, you just get my get your email to me. I'll be happy to put you on the list. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for this time that we could spend together, and we understand that you walk with us, and that we should not walk with the ungodly. We should not walk with those who are doing things that we know in our hearts and in our spirit are against you. And Father, no matter what the circumstance that comes along, we will have faith and trust. You, are God, you have the words of life. Where shall we go but to you? So, Father, we pray for all those in this time of year, in this time of giving thanks, in this time of celebration, that we would give thanks to the one who gives us all things, you, and that we would be grateful in our hearts and our spirit, for we have salvation in our Lord Christ. So, Father, we thank you again. We have to ask that you would bless this uh, funeral that's happening today. Lord, as you were there last night, and, you know, we got to talk about your word and, and that your, your, the hope that we have in you and all things. So, Father, be with that family in this time. Bless all those that are here, that will be here. It is in Christ's name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen, amen, amen.